Um, We have been, I hope you can remember from Ephesians so far, purchased for God by the blood of Jesus. We were dead and he made us live. We have been forgiven and accepted. We have become sons of God, forever his possessions, sealed with the Holy Spirit. We have become priests and kings. We are now taught and led and ruled and loved and made alive and built up and blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We are the possessors, says Paul, of the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. The great and almighty God of the universe has set his affection upon us and then given us his redeeming love in Christ, adopted us into his own family and poured out all the full riches of the inheritance of his mercy on us. We are rich beyond our imagination. Our resources are limitless. Life in time and life in eternity will bring before us thrilling, fantastic, fulfilling and utterly comprehensive riches from the goodness of God. This is the one to whom Paul prays this prayer. The one who has done this list of unbelievably amazing things for us. In chapter 1, you will remember, I hope, that Paul prayed that we would understand all of these things, that we would see our new identity, our new spiritual postcode. I'm lost already. In chapter 3, he prays that we will live this. If chapter 1 is a prayer for enlightenment, then chapter 3 is a prayer for enablement and for action. But sadly today, many Christians chase around in every other direction trying to find the solution to life's problems when they have the solution resident in them, in the indwelling Christ. We need to get that into our thick heads and we need to live it. No more important call could be given to Christians today than this. Pursue Christ. Know Christ. Focus on Christ. Know your resources. Understand what is in Christ. The meaning and the aim and the goal of our life is him, Jesus Christ. And on this day, we come together to celebrate, to focus and to affirm that he is Lord. The world outside, a world with no meaning, knows nothing of us inside. We gather in places like this to celebrate the meaning that we have found in Jesus Christ. Christ has given us meaning. Christ has given us life. Christ has given us everything we need. Before Christ and without Christ, man is without form and void and meaningless. In Christ, life becomes solid, full and full of meaning. And you need nothing more than Christ. If you have problems in your life, things that you can't cope with, then we all do, anxieties that you can't deliver yourself from, it isn't because you haven't found the right formula or you haven't been to the right seminar or you haven't read the right book. It is that you haven't yet learned how to use the resources that are yours already, resident within you because Jesus Christ is in you. So that is Paul's heart as he comes to chapter 3 in this prayer. Let's hear what he says starting in verse 14. Now I'm going to read off the sheet. You can follow either way. Um, Ephesians 3 verse 14 For this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named I pray that he may grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man and that the Messiah may dwell in your hearts through faith I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and width, height and depth, and to know the Messiah's love that surpasses knowledge, so you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in you, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Well, what a prayer. 
Bernard said to the kids, it was a big prayer. Well, it's not a very long prayer, but it is a massive prayer. And the heart of the prayer is not so much that we would know, but that we would be and do. The goal of Paul's prayer is there in verse 19 in the box on the sheet, that we might be filled with the fullness of God, so that we might come to the place where the power of God within us is doing things that exceed even our wildest imagination. There in verse 20. <clears throat> he prays here that a series of great truths, great spiritual realities will take place in our lives so that we will display his glory in verse 21. Now what prompts this prayer is a little bit indicated in the phrase of verse 14, for this reason. He could be talking about going back to the end of chapter 2 as I think Brent alluded to last week. But there's not much agreement from commentators on this. But Calvin, among others, goes, only goes back to verse 13. So he'll do it for me. He says in, Paul says in verse 13, I don't want you to be discouraged. Literally, I don't want you to faint. Even Christians tremble and shake and become anxious and burdened and concerned and they can't resolve their problems and they can't control their environment and they can't get charged of their circumstances. And life can be like that, can't it? But Paul is saying, look, I don't want you to be the kind of people who are discouraged because of my trouble. Paul is in prison. He's under house arrest, but he doesn't want them to faint, to be disheartened or to despair because of that. So for this reason, he says, I'm going to pray for you that rather than being weak and wavering and disheartened, you are going to be, above all, powerful people, exceeding your own expectation of what God could ever accomplish in and through you. He says, I don't want you on the low end, stumbling and bumbling around in weakness, just trying to crawl up to the average level. No, I want you living beyond your expectations. And so I'm bowing my knees before the Father, the Father who is really the one that every family in heaven and on earth comes from, the creator God, the saving, redeeming, adopting God, and I'm going to ask him to work a work in you. First he asks for inner strength. <clears throat> the book of Ephesians, and particularly the first part of the book, describes a Christian's resource. But here we're moving into application. One through three talks about what we have and who we are in Christ. Four through six gets into application, doing. <clears throat> it's like a car, a sports car with a powerful engine and all of its features are described for us. It's described in the first three chapters. The roadmap is laid out in four to six to show you where and how it's supposed to go. And right here is how God turns the ignition on. Paul knows that we can't do it ourselves, so he bows his knee to the only one who can. Now it doesn't do any good to own it and to, it doesn't do any good to know where to drive it if you can't figure out how to turn it on, put it in gear and move it. Well, here you have the ignition in the life of the believer that moves us from what we know to what we are and what we can be in the power of God. And it starts with inner strength. Look there at verse 16. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, which, by the way, are limitless and infinite, that he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. He says, I'm praying that you would have a strong inner man, that God from his riches would strengthen us with power through his spirit. It's so important, isn't it, because the pressures and distresses and troubles and trials of life that come, not only to us, but upon the others that we love, they can tear up the inner man and devastate us and steal our joy and our peace and make us really useless for service and witness. A weak inner man will result in doubt and fear and anxiety, distrust, weakness, sin, a weak inner man leads to frustration, mental strain, emotional and spiritual imbalance. The inner man is the real you, the spirit, the soul, 
what you are inside. And Paul is praying, I want that strong. In a great verse in 2 Corinthians, Paul said that we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Now we live in a culture that is only concerned about the outer man and that's partly because that's all that they can work on. As far as I can tell, I haven't gone into a shopping mall yet to find an inner man department or an inner beauty department. It's all outer and our whole culture is consumed with this to the level of an uncontrollable compulsion. For some people it's reached the proportions of what can only be described as bizarre. But in the process of spiritual growth, we might not see it, but as I look at myself at this point in life and look back and remember some of the faint memories of the spiritual struggles of my youth and at the same time some of my physical exploits, I know very well that while my outer man has grown older, my inner man has grown younger. But it's not me. It's the years and years of God's renewing my heart that has caused that. So in contrast to the perishing outer man, for the Christian there is an increasing strength available to the inner man, an increasing, growing, developing spiritual energy. Paul says, I want you to know that. I want you to be strengthened with his power. That is the power through his spirit that he has for you. It's important to remember here that whenever Paul says you, he means the Ephesian church, or or all of us. The church is made up of individual yous, but Paul is talking to the church as a whole. He's praying, I want that inner man to be so strong it is not easily swayed by the lusts of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the idols we want to keep, and the things of this world that take us away from him. And only the Holy Spirit can give such strength in the inner man. That's precisely why Paul says that you are to be filled with the Spirit. You are to walk in the Spirit. Why, you are to let the Word dwell in you richly. Because when you yield over to the power of the Spirit in your life, you find spiritual strength. Because, as Acts 1 verse 8 says, you will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. The Holy Spirit is in you, in Christ. Paul prays that believers will take hold of that. Romans 8 verse 9 says that every Christian possesses the Holy Spirit. With the Holy Spirit comes power. But it's a matter of feeding that inner man on the richness of the word of God every day, which leads us to the mind of the Spirit, which leads us to yielding to the Spirit and walking in the Spirit and being filled with the Spirit. Paul says that we've all been made to drink the one Spirit. For some of us, though, it's a long time between sips, isn't it? It's amazing how many people never miss their protein shake or that funny-looking green drink or their coffee. But when it comes to drinking in the refreshing, truly life-giving word of God and the power of the Spirit of God, they miss that a lot. It's one thing to understand your riches in Christ. It's something else to get the ignition on. And to get all this power and all this resource and all these riches turned on and moving. It's not much good knowing the first two chapters of Ephesians if you can't get that into practice. And it starts by being strong in the inner man, which means that you are controlled by the word and the spirit. That leads to his second request. As well as a strong inner man, verse 17 asks that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now you might say, well hang on, how can I have a strong inner man if Christ doesn't already dwell in my heart by faith? Well that's a good question, but he's not talking here about salvation. I think you have to take a closer look at the verb dwell. It means to really settle down and be at home. And that's what it's saying. It's not a question of whether Christ is in your life at this point. It's a question of whether he's comfortable, whether he's at home there. You all know the difference between being in a house and being at home. You can be living in a lot of houses but not be at home there. I can settle down and be at home in my house because I don't have to fight the battles there. The battles are in the paddock or down the street 
sometimes in the office, sure, but home is a place of comfort, it's a place of tranquility, it's a place of peace, it's a place of quietness. And that's what it means to dwell. That's what it means to settle down and be at rest. And what Paul's after here is that we as believers have so submitted ourselves to the power of the Holy Spirit, expressed through the word of God, to create a strong inner man, that Christ dwelling in us can settle down and be at rest, be at home, dwell there. So the question we should ask is, is Jesus comfortable in my heart? Is he at home there? Have you submitted to your new landlord? Is your house, your heart clean and orderly the way it should be so that Christ doesn't have to fix this and fix that, adjust this and deal with that, cope with this and confront that, but instead he can settle down and dwell there? What does he find, for example, when he looks in the lounge room or your computer's browser history? John Piper believes the biggest impediment to theological graduates undertaking mission or ministry work is the guilt that is in their heart from what they have seen online or watched on late night television. You see, the Lordship of Christ extends through every part of our lives. He wants it all, and if he has it all, he can settle down and be at home. If you ever want to experience the power of God in your life, it starts by a strong inner man where the Spirit of God is applying the Word of God in a cleansing way and that empowers you. And in that kind of experience, the Lord can dwell, settle down and be at home in your life. The third request, uh, the middle of verse 17. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and width, height and depth, and to know the Messiah's love that surpasses knowledge. When Christ settles down and is at home in your life, he transforms you into love. What does he mean when he says being rooted and established, grounded in love? Well, most of us are gardeners, some better than others. He means that love is not peripheral. Love is not an irrelevant extra. Love is not something on the circumference. Love is not a hit and miss now and then. Love is not a minor detail. It is the essential root and good grounding of all that you are. When Christ dominates your life, the characteristic will be love. It has to be. When Jesus settles down to be at home in your life, he'll fill your life at every point with love. And you will be established solidly in love as a way of life. A love that is deep and secure through all kinds of winds and all kinds of shakings and all kinds of offences. And you will experience love. And not only will you experience it, Paul wants you to comprehend it. Verse 18 uh, says grasp in the NIV, but understand or comprehend is a better word. The word means to seize or to apprehend, a really strong word, to take and make your own possession along with all the saints. It's the common property of all God's children, of all his household. You'll comprehend it. You'll comprehend its breadth and width and height and depth. And you will know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. You will know what you can't know any other way. You'll know what can't be explained by human mouths. The only way to know it is to experience it. When Christ settles down to be at home in your life, your life becomes dominated by a love which is incomprehensible apart from experiencing it. And it isn't going to come to you through some rational means. That must be obvious. It's going to come to you through Christ. Every survey anywhere always says the greatest thing in the world is to be loved, to be loved or to love. The greatest emotion in the world is to feel love. It's the most exhilarating and wonderful feeling there is. And that is precisely what a Christian experiences who is totally claimed by God and purged of the old and then filled with the love of Christ. 
Um, just quickly, I think it's pretty obvious, but what he's trying to say by the breadth and the width and height and depth is to just describe the limitless aspects of God's love, just to take it as far as it can be taken, to the limitless sky above, to the limitless horizons on every side, to the limitless depths beneath. Love extends on and on into infinity, into eternity. So Paul prays that we will have the deep experienced knowledge, the exhilarating joy of knowing that we are loved by the love of God through Christ, a comprehension of its infinity, a comprehension that escapes every human being except those who are rooted and grounded in it because Christ is at home in them, because they are strong in the inner man. And that leads to the end point of the prayer, the end result, verse 19, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Just trying to grasp that thought is mind-boggling, isn't it? But when we are what we ought to be and we follow through what God has for us in these verses, we will be filled up with all the fullness of God. What does that mean? It simply means that we will be like him. Jesus was and is the fullness of the deity, right? Fullness of the Godhead. Jesus was full of grace and truth, and his fullness, we are told, that we have all received. And grace upon grace upon grace. It's the idea that we've become like Christ, like God. You follow this process where you are strong in the inner man, Christ is settled down, is at home, flooding your life with this overwhelming and incomprehensible love, and you're going to find yourself like God. Not like in the Adam and Eve way, grasping after something. But you'll be filled with his attributes. It could come under the category of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, and so on. You're going to have the love of God and the peace of Christ. You're going to know all of that. You're going to have the knowledge of God and the wisdom of God to whatever degree we as fallen humans, transformed by Christ, are capable now, when it says you are filled up with the fullness of God, it doesn't mean you become God. It simply means that the essence of who God is in his glory is going to be filling your life. If I go down to the ocean or if Bernard goes down to the ocean this week, I take a glass and I scoop up some of the ocean. It wouldn't be right to say that the entire Pacific Ocean is in my glass because there's much, much more. It is vast and vastly beyond my glass. All of the ocean is not in my glass, but all that the ocean is, is in my glass. The essence of what it is is contained there, just as God is in his children. That is such a wonderful and radical and transforming prayer, isn't it? How in heaven and earth is such a prayer possible? Can God even do something like this? Hopefully you can remember the question I posed just a few minutes ago. Can God even do something like this? Well, look at verse 20. It is just amazing. Not only is he able to do all that we ask, not only is he able to do all that we think or imagine, he is able to do above and beyond, immeasurably more. The word is superabundantly, more than we ask. He is able to do superabundantly more than we think or imagine. We need to remind ourselves often that this is the God that Paul prayed to. This is the God that we pray to. You want to be a confident Christian? Remember who God is. Remember who your Father is. Paul walked this path, and that's why to the Colossians he said in chapter 1 that God works in me mightily. Paul was a living illustration of verse 20, Ephesians 3.20. The man did things beyond what he could ever ask or think possible. He endured things far beyond his power to stand firm. 
Tremendous power is available for every issue of life. For example, our evangelism, as Steve Abbott so clearly pointed out, is not tied up to our cleverness. It's not tied up to our style or our speaking ability. Praise the Lord. It's connected to our power, which is connected to this spiritual resource. To Ephesians chapter 1 and 2 and description there. The fullness of the power of Jesus Christ through his spirit is in us. It's such a foolish thing, such an ignorant thing, such a faithless thing to wander around in our Christian experience thinking that we are inadequate, thinking that we are unable, when in fact we are all being filled with the fullness of God. If you're not seeing the power of God in your life, it's because you are not filled with the fullness of God. If you're not filled with the fullness of God, it's because you are not grounded and rooted in love, because you are not filled with Christ, because he's not at home, because you are not strong in the inner man. And it just goes back through to verse 16. But please don't be disheartened, because just as Paul prayed... God wants you to be filled with all his fullness. And better still, he is making that happen. Even if you can't see it or you don't think it, he is filling you with his fullness. We have unrestricted access to the power of the almighty triune God. Have you noticed how often the three persons of God, the Trinity, are referred to in these seven verses, eight verses? They are all active in Paul's desire that we be filled with all the fullness of God. Just as a quick example, we couldn't understand God's love fully without Jesus' life, death and resurrection. We couldn't understand anything of God's mercy without the Spirit revealing it to us. As you come through your particular path of progress and arrive at the place where you're being filled up with the fullness of God, you will see things occur in your life beyond what you could have imagined. When trials come, you'll have a strength that you never knew was there. When ministry opportunities come, you'll have a strength and a power in that ministry that you never knew was there. You might ask, why would God do all of this? Why would he want me to be so full? So powerful. Well, the answer is there in verse 21. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. It is in order that he might display his glory through the church. Can you see that when we run around saying that we belong to Christ, we belong to God, our God is a mighty and powerful and saving and transforming God, Yet we have weak, vacillating lives that people assume that either our God is lying or we're lying about who he is and what he's like. The world looks at the church, what do they see? Power? Sadly, often no. It's weakness. So what do they conclude? That God is all-powerful, as we're claiming here in Ephesians? No, those are his people. Take a look at them. God wants glory in the church. Not only in eternity where you'll certainly get it, but now as well. To all generations, starting now and on forever. He wants glory. He deserves glory. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. That's the reason for everything. So my prayer for you, that is you as individuals, and especially you as the church, is that you will be to the glory of God, that you will bring him praise and honour and respect and admiration from the people who see you and conclude that he is indeed a powerful, mighty, saving, transforming God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the great truths that um, are in Ephesians about you, about what you are like, about what you have done for us. 
Father, forgive us for being poor, uh, poor examples, poor shining lights uh, for your name. Father, help us to learn from Ephesians, to learn from Paul, to learn from your Holy Spirit what it means to be your children and to live like we are. Amen.